Luke 14 is where our gospel lectionary reading lands today. These gospel portions of the lectionary have been hanging around Luke since June of this year. So if you've been preaching on or studying these gospel sections, you may have gathered by now that Luke, a sophisticated writer, able to appeal to the upper echelon Greco-Roman and Jewish society, has a well another mic if that would be helpful yeah I'll switch to Kevin thank you that's fine I'll get wait for you to get the levels am I, am I okay yeah so we're talking about Luke's agenda of inclusivity he wants to broaden the scope of social and religious significance to include the people on the margins and he's pretty relentless and, consist and consistent about this. Take the beginning of this chapter, for instance. Luke has already set up the idea that there's a religious elite whose suspicion of Jesus has now turned into hostility. <laughs> if you read the insults that Jesus levels at them in chapter 11, the blood would rush to your head too. Some members of this religious elite are watching Jesus like a hawk now trying to trip him up, denounce his credibility, uh, injure his popularity. Well, just kill him if it comes to that. He's in the house of one of these people of high social rank for a meal on the Sabbath. And not only are his detractors watching Jesus, he is also watching them. He observes how when they show up, they position themselves in the best places at the table. These places of honor say something about the persons who occupy them. They rank you above the others in the room. They speak of your high importance and elevated social status. So Jesus is watching this jockeying, right? This finagling all of which goes against the very grain of all that he has been talking about the kingdom of God up until this point, where the first shall be last and the last shall be first, where children are model citizens, where domestic and agrarian life matter as much as civic and religious life does, where in-groups are cracked open by love that sees and values the other. I can imagine him looking around at this seating arrangement carefully designed to preserve what Carolyn Sharp calls the calculated reciprocity of high society. If you're having a hard time imagining this way, this you, you may relate to the staged seating arrangements at wedding receptions or professional gatherings where there's a head table. And just looking at those seated closer to the head table gives you some idea of their status. Well, this calls for a parable. And it's not your story kind of parable. It's more like your wise sayings kind of parable. A contemporary version of this parable might say, when you're invited to a conference, a banquet, a meeting, seat yourself in the lowest place, by the back door, next to the trash can, the furthest away from the head table maybe, so that if the Ursha asks you to move, it can only get better. But then comes, then, then comes the capstone verse for the parable. And, and this is what made me squirm every time I read this text. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who, humbled them, who humble themselves will be exalted. We've heard it so many times if you've been in church any number of times. Let me be honest. The parable would have been fine for me without that epigram. I would have got the message because from the time that saying was uttered until now, women, black, brown, and indigenous people, LGBTQ plus people, immigrant, refugee, and other oppressed or marginalized people have not found this to be true. And these are the kinds of people who have had this proverb preached to, to them 
for the purpose of keeping them in their place. Because any sign of their exaltation is met with crushing might by the already exalted ones. In this parable, Jesus is speaking specifically to people of privilege. And I would urge all preachers and Bible interpreters to let it be so. Oppressed people tend to find this verse insulting because in their status, they are not subjects humbling their own selves. They are objects who have been placed in a humiliating position they would have never chosen. Candidly, I say this with most, with utmost humility as I stand before the word of God. If I had chosen the capstone verse for this parable, it would sound something more like, for the place of honor is not yours alone. Loving your neighbor as yourself acknowledges that someone else may also be worthy of the best place. That's how I would have said it, Jesus, but you know, you. Well, Jesus must have seen his host watching in horror at this bombshell. So Jesus turns to him and proceeds to refine the teaching. He says to this person of privilege, when you give a dinner, don't limit the invitations to your kinfolk, your friends, your rich neighbors, or anyone else whom you can count on to return the favor. Try inviting some folk who don't have the same level of social capital, who can't travel first class, who have no degrees or titles, who can't quote from anybody but their grandmother, who don't have a mailing address, whose prison record keeps them from being properly employed. Try inviting some folk without the kind of economic, social, academic, or religious privilege you enjoy is what I hear. This parable and its follow-up lesson is not a call to false modesty or even reckless Pollyanna kind of hospitality. It's a lesson in the culture and the social dynamics of the kingdom of God, of the reign of God. It's a call to inclusion. It's a call to widen the circle of who we as individuals count as important and who we as groups consider welcome. This is a call to the kind of love that deeply recognizes human worth despite the packaging and is prepared to do as God did when God widened the circle of widen the divine circle to include all of that which is not God so that we can have eternal life. I hope you got that, but you get it again. Because my South Asian colleague, theologian John Bupalan was the first one I heard say this. He was deeply influenced by the ethicist Nicholas Wolterstoff and John preached it to me this way once. Quote, we let the other, one who's not like us, Occupy our thinking and feeling in such a way that it extends and deepens our sense of responsibility. As Christians, he said, we believe that we owe our existence to someone who is other than us, God. God gave us breath. We live, therefore, with borrowed breath. God gave us time. We live, therefore, in borrowed time. God is different than us. But in seeking to be with us who are different, God thus found, found God's center of gravity outside of God's self and calls us to go and do likewise. John preached that sermon titled The Gospel According to the Nobodies in a middle to upper class congregation where I was once serving as associate pastor. Sitting there listening to John that morning was Paul, not his real name. Paul's name was not on the membership roll. Uh, he was there every Sunday though, he came early, left after coffee hour. And the pew where he sat was mostly empty except for one or two persons. 
Paul did not have a mailing address. His Sunday best was the same rumpled, oversized shirt and pants. And he didn't exactly smell of Irish spring or whatever men's deodorant soap you use. And he was missing a few teeth here and there. Still, he sang and he prayed as heartily as the best of us. In the fellowship room for coffee after church, there was a, a, a wide berth around Paul, except for the same one or two people, one of whom was Cindy, again, not her real name, a young, no-nonsense, upward mobile, upwardly mobile corporate executive. Now, as pastors, we had talked about Paul because we had got complaints. <laughs> we had received complaints about him being there, him hanging out in the coffee hour room. We felt that he belonged, and we resisted any effort to make him feel less so. It was only after Paul died that Cindy told the story of how she joined the church. Paul had been the first person to greet her, smile at her, extend his hand to shake hers. She found herself sitting next to him in worship when she came and he would brighten up every time she sat down. And when they went to the fellowship room afterwards, he would never let her stand by herself without company. He is the reason I joined this church, Cindy said. I never knew he wasn't a member here. He acted like he belonged and he drew me in. I wish I could have told that story to make the congregation look like the hero. <laughs> but maybe this is how parables go, right? Riddles that stand life on its head. Sayings full of paradox. Stories of reversal. Well, just like the parable, Jesus' little mini lecture to the host has its own capstone saying, which I don't fancy either. <laughs> I don't believe that the reward at the end of the age is enough to motivate or sustain the rigors of kingdom love. So, and my version of that capstone verse 14 would also eliminate naming the crippled, lame, and blind because of how that stigmatizes differences of physical ability. So my version, my humble version, <laughs> would simply read, but when you give a banquet, widen the scope of your guests to include persons who have been marginalized, considered outsiders, and those of the disenfranchised community. For of such is the kingdom of God. I believe that the sweet by and by can infringe upon the unpalatable here and now when our love draws a wider circle, shifting our center of gravity and making the kingdom of God look more like a block party than a banquet hall. Amen. <laughs>